Next, let's introduce some new notation, the row space and the column space of a matrix. The row space is the span of each of the rows of the matrix. Let's call our matrix A. If we say A is M by N, that means it has M rows, N columns. The row space would be each of the rows. The row space is a subspace of R, well, how long is each of these rows? It has N components, so it's a subspace of Rn. And the column space is the span of each of the columns in our matrix A. So if we're saying our matrix is M by N, there'll be N columns. And this is a subspace of, well, how long is each of these columns? It has M components, so it's a subspace of Rm. If we look at these matrices on the left we have a three by four matrix if we row reduce we get this large matrix on the right this is the same matrix so we're just looking at two different aspects of it now we get a matrix that is in row echelon form and this is useful for finding the basis of the row space and the basis of the column space it's important to note that row operations don't change the row space and column operations don't change the column space, but the opposite is not true. Row operations generally change the column space. Since we've now row reduced to get this matrix in row echelon form, we can see we have two leading ones. The last row is all zeros, so we don't need that. That doesn't add anything to the span of our row space. So the basis of our row space would be row one and two. The basis of our column space, on the other hand, would be the columns with the leading ones, but not the columns of our row reduced matrix, the columns with the leading ones, so column one and column two, of our original matrix. Since column three and four don't have leading ones, they aren't needed in the basis of the column space. One last thing to mention is the rank theorem. Firstly, since both the column space and the row space are dependent on the number of leading ones in our row echelon form of our matrix, we can say that their dimensions are equal. Remember that the dimension is the number of elements in every single basis of that space. And what does this equal? This equals the rank of A, where rank, remember, is just the number of leading ones. Next, if we want to put into words what we just showed, we can say the R non-zero rows of the row echelon form of our matrix form a basis of row A. And if we have leading ones in columns J1 through to JR of this row echelon form of the matrix, these columns of our original matrix form a basis of column A. Let's find the rank of this matrix as well as the bases of the row space and the column space. Let's begin by row reducing. First, we want a leading one. So let's do row one divided by two. And just to simplify our last row, we can divide by three. Next, we want zeros under that leading one. We can do row two plus two row one, row three minus four row one, and row four plus two row one. We can divide row two by negative two. Next, we can do row three minus four row two. Next, we want a leading one here. So we could either interchange rows three and four, or we can multiply by negative one. And then we can do row four minus row three. Now that our matrix is in row echelon form, we could have gone further and sought zeros above each of the leading ones. But in this case, it's not necessary. We see that we have three leading ones, so our rank is three. This also means that the dimension of our row space and the dimension of our column space should be three. Let's find the basis of row A. This is the rows with a leading one in them. We wanna write these vectors as rows. For the row space of A, we don't need this final row since it's all zeros. For the column space of A, we look back to our original matrix and all three columns are leading, so we can write out all three columns. 